Hello, everybody. Um, I'm here. My name is Lydia Wood. Uh, I work for nuclearban.us, which is a part of the international campaign to abolish nuclear weapons. Um, they've been getting a lot of attention. Um, and I'm going to talk about my work with this and about nuclear weapons from a social justice perspective. So I'm going to talk a little bit about nuclear weapons, give you, give you some updates about where we are today. Um, really analyze the myth of nuclear deterrence from a social justice and feminist perspective, the impacts that these weapons have, um, the corporate power infrastructure that underlies nuclear weapons, um, and the nuclear ban treaty as a path to the ultimate elimination. So nuclear weapons, uh, today we have approximately 14,400. Um, if you were alive during the Cold War, uh, at, at one point we had up to like 70,000. So the fact that we've reduced it this much is actually a, a tremendous feat. Uh, but at the same time, that number is more than enough to uh, destroy the world many times over. Um, New estimates from the Physicians for Social Responsibility and IPP and W um, assess that um, 100 weapons might actually be enough to like lead to global famine. Um, so we have we have a lot more than that. Um, about 90 percent of the world's arsenal is owned by the U.S. and Russia, um, and we have 2,000 weapons that are on hair trigger alert which means they're ready to be launched within minutes. Um, so if there's ever an incident or a miscommunication, uh, there's the reaction time or the space for diplomacy um, in those situations is very limited uh, because they only have a couple minutes to, to react, which is partly why these weapons are so dangerous today. Um, so there are five European nations that host our nuclear weapons on their soil. Um, as part of NATO um, nuclear sharing arrangement and about two dozen other nations claim to rely on our nuclear weapons for their own national security um, and that that's falling into this notion of deterrence um, in addition every country there's there's nine countries with nuclear weapons all of them are actually working on modernizing and upgrading their nuclear arsenals uh, under Trump, that has been expanded. Uh, we are committed to spending $1.7 trillion um, on top of the 30 to 40 billion that we're already spent every year to maintain, um, which we calculated and that comes to about $10 million an hour that we spend on these weapons that we say should never be used. Um, so it's a tremendous waste of resources. Um, so the U.S. has a nuclear triad, which means we have weapons that are able to be launched by land, air, and sea. Um, our sea-based missiles are kept in the Ohio class Trident submarines. We have, uh, this is an image of them. We have 18 of these. Just for a perspective, um, each of these submarines has 20 missiles. Um, these are the missiles that are able to launch nuclear weapons. Each missile has five nuclear warheads on them. Um, and each warhead is about 25 times the power of the Hiroshima bomb um, that was dropped in World War II. So just on this submarine alone, that's enough uh, nuclear power to, to lead to potential nuclear winter or uh, um, basically destroy life on Earth. So other weapons are kept in missile silos, in uh, bombers, um, in bases, or sometimes even in planes that are flying above us in the sky. So I'm sure everybody knows this, but the U.S. is the only country to have ever dropped a nuclear weapon. We invented them and we're the only country to have ever used them in war. Um, we use them in Hiroshima back in 1945. Uh, the, the narrative you might get in, 
in history classes is that the dropping of the Hiroshima bomb led to the end of World War II, um, but there's a lot of evidence that that's false, um, that Japanese were already ready to surrender at that point before we dropped the bomb. It was more about showing to the global community that the U.S. had this power, um, and that's why we wanted to use them. So when we dropped that bomb, um, there were 60 to 80,000 people that were killed instantly. In addition, you had uh, similar numbers that died slowly within four months um, due to radiation poisoning, uh, which is just a horrible, um, horrible conditions around that. And about 250,000 to date, if you uh, consider cancers. Um, there's been studies coming out about nuclear testing and fallout from nuclear testing and how that's gotten in um, our livestock and in dairy um, and through like through grasses once it falls. Um, and the estimates of that is that uh, just the fallout from testing will eventually kill two million people as a result of cancers from, from these weapons. So these weapons know no boundaries. Um, and it's also a women's issue. Women die at, tr at uh, twice the rates of men from radiation exposure. Um, and it really has horrible impacts on fertility. Um, so any use of nuclear weapons would have catastrophic consequences. Um, there's no effective humanitarian response that would be possible. Um, and the effects of radiation would cause suffering and death many years from the initial explosion and even across generations in many cases. Um, so this is a post from a doctor, telegram sent back from a doctor who was uh, in Hiroshima um, about two weeks after the bomb was dropped. He says, city wiped out, 80%, all hospitals destroyed or seriously damaged. Inspected two emergency hospitals, conditions beyond description. Effects of bomb, mysteriously serious. Many victims apparently recovering suddenly suffer fatal relapse due to decomposition of white blood cells and other internal injuries, um, now dying in great numbers. Estimated still over 100,000 wounded in emergency hospitals located located surroundings, sadly lacking uh, bandaging materials and medicine. So one of the, one of the things with nuclear weapons um, is we really don't have a way to respond to them. If there was ever to be a nuclear detonation or an accident, we don't have, um, we don't have a way of dealing with that. Um, we saw that with Hiroshima. You had all but two hospitals were completely destroyed in the bombing. And then, uh, because we don't really have an effective way to deal with radiation itself, um, people are basically helpless. Um, that's why, when you look at the anti-nuclear movement, it's often led by physicians, uh, people in the medical field, who, who recognize how horrible these weapons are. So one of the arguments for why we still need these weapons is that nuclear weapons act as a deterrent so, do you guys know what the theory of deterrent, deterrence is? <laughs> yeah, the theory is basically like these weapons are so tremendously horrible, they're so uh, violent and destructive, and attacking a country with a nuclear, or that has a nuclear weapon would ultimately be suicide, uh, because you would be annihilated too. Um, but there's a lot of problems with that, partly it's simplistic, people say that uh, we haven't had World War III, partly because of nuclear weapons, but if you look at it, we've been involved in war co pretty much consistently in some way or another um, since the end of World War II. Um, when you look at how nuclear powers use nuclear weapons, it's often more as a tactic to bully um, smaller nations um, or other nuclear nations um, to to basically um, negotiate terms that represent their own interests. So, so it's a very imperialistic t uh, tool. You have these nine countries that are essentially able to hold the rest of the world hostage um, with these weapons. Um, 
I also think it's very much related to a male-dominated way of thinking um, that equates strength with violence and violence with power um, rather than one that would look at uh, negotiation and cooperation and um, international uh, diplomacy as, as tools of strength. Um, and I think that that's a narrative that we need to get back to. Um, often when you're talking about the nuclear weapons movement today, it's seen as, as a predominantly white-led movement. Um, it's something that uh, is, is a white middle class issue. Uh, you don't really see as many young people, um, as many people of color within the movement today. Um, but that, that really isn't historically true, and it's very much been tied to the civil rights movement. Um, there's a great book called African Americans Against the Bomb, um, and if anybody's interested in that, I thoroughly recommend reading it. Um, it looks at how this fight against for nuclear weapons abolition and against imperialism uh, were deeply tied, and it was deeply tied within uh, the civil rights struggle as well. Um, this is a quote from Martin Luther King in 1968. Um, I might have this wrong, but this might have also actually been when he accepted the Nobel Peace Prize for his work. Um, and he was talking about how a threat of, or just the injustice of one country, or a couple countries being able to destroy life on Earth, um, that, that's something that we need to be fight, fighting for or against. Um, and it's very much tied to human rights and civil rights. So getting back to the myth of deterrence, there's another couple ways that you can look at it. One is that um, once you start thinking of, of these weapons as a source of, of strength, it creates a slippery slope where all these 200 of other, other nations are going to potentially try to seek out weapons um, for their own national security. Uh, which is very dangerous, especially when you have uh, despotic regimes or regimes that might be alienated from the international community, um, seeing this as, as a tool for their own safety, which is actually quite rational under, under deterrence theory to, to push for that. Um, another problem is that we simply don't have perfect technology. Uh, we, don't under, we never operate under perfect knowledge or the perfect ability to communicate. Uh, so there's a great book called Command and Control, which has looked at uh, US nuclear weapons accidents um, based on our government's own documents. Found that there have been thousands of close calls um, just in the US alone of uh, accidental detonation. And a lot of that's just been about miscommunication, uh, technology going wrong, um, all these little kinks in the system that multiply the ability of, or the possibility of something catastrophic happening. I'd like to interject that yeah. uh, a more sophisticated suicide bomber would throw out the whole deterrence aspect of it. If you know you're going to die anyway, all you need is the technology and the infrastructure yeah. to launch a nuclear weapon, and then so you die, that's the whole method behind the suicide bomber. So it's not out of the realm of yeah. consideration. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I mean, that's another issue is, is the fact that there's always a possibility that a terrorist could, could potentially get their hands on a weapon like this, um, or even the possibility of the computer systems or mechanics being hacked. Uh, so these are real, real threats. Um, I also like to think of, of the way that the U.S. has used these weapons um, as a tool of imperialism. I think that that's a very important um, lens through which to understand them. So here are just a couple of examples. Um, at one point, right after the weapon was used, Stalin actually asked Truman, requested that the bomb, uh, the nuclear bomb, be put under international control at the newly established UN. Uh, that was rejected. 
Um, you have Reagan refusing to forgo his Star Wars program to dominate and control the military use of outer space. You have uh, Clinton um, at one point rejected uh, Vladimir Putin's offer to cut the arsenals, which at that time were about 18,000 bombs, uh, to 1,000 each and call everybody to the table to negotiate for their elimination. Um, provided we don't put our missiles in Eastern Europe, which we now have. Uh, so it's probably been arguably more times than this, but Joseph Gerson, who's, who's an anti-nuclear advocate, has calculated that there's been about 50 episodes um, of what you would call nuclear blackmail, which is where a nuclear power basically uses or threatens to use a weapon um, to negotiate on terms favorable to them. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about the humanitarian impacts. So I, I've talked about how deadly these weapons are when they're used, but even when they're not used, they are also harming and killing people. Um, and the people that they impact the most are already marginalized communities, uh, colonized regions, and indigenous peoples. Uh, so, yeah, indigenous peoples, veterans, uh, minorities, and occupied regions are the most impacted from nuclear weapons production and testing. So, uh, the estimates um, out of the International Physicians for the Prevention of Nucle Nuclear War is that about 2.4 million people are estimated to die eventually from the impacts of atmospheric testing. 70% um, of uranium, which is, is very poisonous substance, substance uh, that we use to make the radioactive uh, components of a nuclear weapon, uh, most of that comes from indigenous lands. Um, and when you look at the history of testing, um, right now we have only tested, we're testing weapons underground, um, and I believe it's been at least a decade since we've like uh, actually detonated a bomb um, through our testing. But that impact lives on, and a lot of our testing took place in the Marshall Islands, um, which were basically uh, occupied, colonized regions. You had thousands of people that were displaced and disconnected uh, from their territory uh, through that testing. Um, this is an image of the U.S. military evacuating inhabitants from, uh, I believe it was the Bikini Atoll, uh, which was uh, a, an island, an inhabited island, where we actually tested the largest nuclear, the second largest nuclear weapon ever detonated, and it was a thousand times more powerful than Hiroshima. Um, and they've never ever been able to return to that land that they were displaced from. There's some images. Uh, so the fallout from the Castle Bravo test that I was just referencing, um, it turned out to be way more powerful uh, than people had realized or estimated. And so you had people, uh, literally, they were they didn't have any advance warning, and there was uh, like radioactive ash and snow falling from the sky. Um, and they're still uh, struggling with the, the health impacts and legacy of that. Do you guys want to watch a slightly disturbing video? Just like a dog. Hello, hello. Mommy, come on. We will have fallen and burn. And we will call her. And we will kill him. People from wrong like that burn all over the neck, legs, and arms, and hair fall off. 
If it was an accident, they should have taken action right away to evacuate the people from the They didn't. Okay, so just to contextualize that a bit, uh, that, that was uh, images of the Castle Bravo test on the Marshall Islands, and it was later revealed that there were government documents um, that wanted to look at what uh, the effects of radiation were on people from prolonged exposure. So while they evacuated people within a very immediate range, uh, they, they left people within the fallout zone for a number of days. Um, and then once it was realized uh, how bad it was, that you, you start to have the military coming in and evacuating. Um, but They've never really dealt with this. Uh, they're still, um, they, they did at one point set up a Marshall's Claim Tribunal for reparations uh, to people affected. Um, and it quickly ran out of money within like a couple years. And there's still a tremendous amount of unheard cases and it needs to be refunded. So that is another side of the whole nuclear weapons issue, and it's one that we very rarely hear, is that there are still a bunch of people um, and, and generations of people who are living with the aftermath of that, um, including people who sur whose families survived Hiroshima, um, it might be the grandchildren, but that still are exposed to higher level of radiation. Um, and that's part of the responsibility of, of a nuclear weapon state to deal with that, and part of the international community's responsibility to deal with that. So when you talk about nuclear weapons today, they must be understood in relationship to corporate power and economic justice as well. Um, so in the US, we are currently spending about 10 million per hour in taxpayer money to build these weapons and maintain these weapons that we say we should never use. Um, so it's a tremendous race of money, or waste of money that is stripping uh, resources from communities that could be much better spent. Um, and you can also look at the, the corporate structure that is benefiting from maintaining these weapons. They happen to, there's 26 companies. Um, that are the major like uh, beneficiaries of U.S. government contracts uh, to make and maintain. That's everything from General Dynamics to Lockheed Martin to Honeywell. Um, and they happen to have some of the most powerful lobbies in Washington. Um, and so they really, they bankroll the politicians on both sides of the political spectrum, both Democrats and Republicans. Um, and it makes it very hard to have anything that's not a bipartisan consensus um, in support of at least some degree of nuclear weapon um, maintenance. So the graph on the right here, I found this very interesting. This is from a 2015 Princeton study. It looked at American public stances on over 2,000 different public policy issues, and it found that no matter how much support there was for a particular position or policy, um, that if it didn't line up with the interests of economic elite and major lobbyists, then it likely wouldn't have gotten passed into law. Um, so it essentially shows that as more and more average citizens support an issue, um, that it's not any more likely to get what they want adopted into public policy unless it lines up with uh, the people who already have a lot of power within our system. Um, so it really challenges the idea of whether we have a functioning democracy anymore, which is a subject for another debate. Um, but it's also something you have to consider when you're dealing with uh, the, the bipartisan um, juggernaut and support of the military industrial complex and nuclear weapons in particular. Um, so if you break it down to like really small um, suppliers of particular uh, aspects for, for nuclear weapons um, or particular parts, um, there's probably about 150 companies, give or take, 
that, that work on it in some way. Uh, but these up here, these are the 26 companies that happen to get the largest share of the contracts that make up the bulk. Um, probably a lot of these you've never even heard of. Um, some of them have kind of crazy <coughs> structures. One of them up there, Draper Laboratories, is actually a nonprofit, <laughs> um, which is crazy that a nonprofit is is able to, to be part of this structure and system making nuclear weapons. Um, but these are the companies that we need to be putting pressure on and targeting. So, so given all that context, it can seem very bleak, but fortunately there is a movement and a new tool that is really offering us a path in the anti-nuclear movement to further stigmatize these weapons, um, to create new uh, international norms, around uh, how deadly these weapons are um, that over time can, can get us to the point where we might actually be able to start to eliminate them altogether. Um, and this is the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. Uh, so in July of 2017, you have 122 nations, so the majority of the world's nations, came together at the United Nations uh, and voted to adopt this treaty. Uh, that it's the first comprehensive ban on nuclear weapons under international law. So we've done this before. We've done this with chemical weapons, with biological weapons, with landmines. Um, those weapons still exist, but as that norm has strengthened, um, they're, they've been reduced, stockpiles have been reduced, um, and it's gotten to the point where it's totally unacceptable for them to be used. The other aspect of this treaty is it makes it illegal not just to use nuclear weapons, but to, uh, to build, to produce, to assist, uh, to threaten to use, to transport. Um, so once you start to get like NATO countries signing on to this, or um, countries that are important US allies or that might have a base, uh, an American military base, it's gonna start to actually like affect the US operation. Um, and that's, that's partly why they're so, there's so much um, internal opposition uh, from US leaders about this treaty. Um, and I think that that has to do with its strength. Um, the other thing that I think is really profound about this treaty is, I think I mentioned this earlier, it's, it's essentially been led by campaigners from Africa, from Latin America, from uh, Europe, from non-nuclear states who are recognizing that this is a global issue, that nuclear weapons aren't, aren't something that's restricted uh, to, to a nuclear weapon state to have like an opinion on or to recognize it as a, as a huge humanitarian issue. Um, the head of the international campaign to abolish nuclear weapons is named Bea Finn. Um, and she, she compares kind of our approach um, pre-treaty to being very much like almost like an apartheid era um, system around nuclear weapons discourse where only the countries like the US or Russia could, could really embark on like serious game theory negotiations <laughs> about, about nuclear weapons and their utility, where the rest of the country, or the rest of the world, it was seen as a, this is not your issue. Um, and this treaty is actually really challenging that. So as I mentioned, this has been largely made possible by ICANN, um, International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons. It has 500, uh, civil society organizations in 100 countries that are working on this. It's very youth-led as well. It tends to be a, a much younger generation of people working on this um, and very female-dominated. Uh, they won the Nobel Peace Prize in uh, 2017 for their effort. Um, this woman in the middle is Tsuko Thurlow. She's a very impressive woman. She uh, was a teenager when she survived the Hiroshima bombing and she's made it her life's mission to work for a nuclear weapons free world and so she went up there with ICANN um, to accept that prize.
under the treaty, anybody that signs on to this treaty agrees not to develop, test, produce, manufacture, possess, stockpile, use, threaten to use, um, also to assist, which I think is huge. Um, they can't assist another country um, in, in uh, their nuclear weapon system. So again, it, fo it follows um, on the path of other banned weapons that have been uh, put into international law. So for those that argue, okay, well this is good, but the U.S. is never going to sign it, um, so what's the point? Uh, there's actually evidence, so so in, in U.S. military documents and weapons uh, or manuals, <laughs> they, they talk about how uh, it, is, it is official U.S. military policy to try to abide by international law and treaties. Um, in how they conduct war and, and military. So the more that these become stigmatized and it becomes like a stronger international norm, um, the harder it will be for the U.S. to keep violating it. Um, so for example, the U.S. never signed uh, the U.N. treaty prohibit prohibiting and banning cluster munitions, um, which went into effect in 2007. Um, and you can see it, they've, since then, since it went into effect, uh, we have only dropped it one time in Yemen. Um, and we've largely, while we still sometimes sell it to other nations, we aren't using them or producing them. Or we aren't using them within our own military exercises. We do still produce them. Under Article 6 of the treaty, um, it actually, starts to try to put in a place for international cooperation for victim remediation. Um, so it tries to establish a norm around supporting people um, who have been victims of nuclear weapons use and testing. So that would require the international community um, under that norm, that new norm, to do something about the Marshall Islands and, and these other communities that we've Really hard. So what are we doing here in the U.S.? Um, and my campaign, I'm the campaign coordinator for Nuclear Ban U.S., uh, just to reiterate. And what I'm doing is we go around trying to build support for the treaty uh, here in this country to start to mobilize people and educate people. Um, one of the ways that we do that is we're trying to get people to disconnect uh, through divestment campaigns, uh, through boycotts, and through legislative efforts um, from the companies making nuclear weapons. So what that might look like, um, there is a campaign underway right now to divest the p pension funds of New York City from those 26 companies, uh, which I think is a very good way of targeting those companies directly rather than just uh, appealing to politicians who, who likely won't just listen to us on this issue. So it's another way of targeting them. Um, back in the 80s, you had uh, hundreds of cities across the U.S. Um, passed legislative efforts that said, said things like, we won't have any nuclear weapon work conducted in our city. No nuclear weapons can be transported through our city. They can't be housed in our city. Um, and that had a big effect. Uh, during the Cold War. Um, at one point we had about 70,000 nuclear weapons in the world and that robust movement um, helped diminish those nuclear weapons. And then unfortunately that movement died out. Uh, they thought they'd solved the problem um, once you see the Soviet Union fall apart and the end of the Cold War, but um, unfortunately we're back in another arms race. So. What else we can do is educate people, spread the word about how uh, these weapons are still so dangerous um, and why this is an issue in spite of all the other issues that we're confronted with on a daily basis that we still need to continue to organize around. Um, and we can also build stigma and strengthen norms against profiting off nuclear weapons. So it might be hard to um, at a domestic level to just straight up stigmatize uh, 
um, the existence of nuclear weapons like at a nationwide level, but what we can do is we can work at our universities. We can say, hey, I don't want my public institution to be complicit and to profit off of uh, weapons that have the ability to destroy life on Earth or to cause nuclear win winter or famine. Um, and that helps build, build a lot of stigma in the process. And I also want to reiterate, a lot of these companies also do other horrible things. <laughs> so like Lockheed Martin, Honeywell, General Dynamics, they are the ones building the bombs that we are dropping in Yemen. Uh, they are also the ones uh, helping support like fracking um, and doing all this other horrible stuff on top of it. So the, the idea behind our campaign came from the I'm Still In movement. Um, and that formed after Trump pulled out of the Paris Climate Accords and you start to have cities and uh, individuals and faith communities around the world saying, I'm still in, I'm still gonna meet these targets. Um, so that's, that's our goal. Uh, these are some of our booklets that we have targeting different groups and some of our campaigners. So if you're interested in uh, getting involved, you can sign up to our website, um, which is www.nuclearban.us, and I have a bunch of materials over there as well. Um, do you guys have any questions, comments? <laughs>